Okay, we are going to start this webinar over. Thank you for those of you who are sticking with us and joining us for the next 45 minutes to an hour for our Grants 101 webinar. My name is Samantha Watson. I'm the CEO of the SAM Fund, and I'm joined by Michelle Landwehr, our COO, and Hello. Patrick Knox-Russell, our Grants Assistant. And we're going to take this time to share with you some information about the SAM Fund and some information about our grants, um, answer questions you might have, and give you some information and tips and insights from our reviewers over the years to help you or someone you know submit the strongest applications. So if you're listening to this webinar and if you're listening live and need to go back to it, it's being recorded. And if you're listening to it and know of someone else in your life who might benefit from knowing about our program, please send them our way, share this presentation with them, um, have them get in touch with us. If you have a question during the webinar, you can send a chat directly to Patrick. You'll see a little chat icon at the top of your screen. Or you can send us an email to grants at thesamfund.org. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation, but if we aren't able to get um, to everybody's questions, then we will follow up with you within a day or two um, and give you the answer or the information you need. Okay, so quick background and snapshot about the SAM Fund. The SAM Fund is um, an organization based in Boston. Um, it was created in 2003 to help young adults specifically with their financial challenges after treatment because what we know, and I'm a cancer survivor myself, what I know is that once you look fine, everybody assumes that you're ready to sort of get back to things. And we know that that's not quite so easy. So what we're here to do is really provide some um, assistance and support around the financial struggles that follow cancer treatment and help you get back on your feet. Our tagline is cancer isn't free. You may have seen that already. And the reason for that is that most people outside of the cancer community you know, know the term cancer free and it's something to be celebrated and it's something to, to hope for and look forward to. And in the end, um, Yes, it's a very lucky thing to be cancer-free, but it also brings with it a whole set of challenges that most people don't know about. And what we know is that the cost of cancer goes so far beyond just the medical bills. We know that a lot of times it can cost you anything you may have had in savings. It can force you to spend time away from work or leave your job entirely. We know that the cost of insurance um, or COBRA can be pretty astronomical and things like co-pays and everyday living expenses just add up. And when you're a young adult in your 20s and 30s and facing all of these bills, it can be that much more challenging because most people at that life stage don't have a whole lot in the bank to begin with. And so when cancer costs you everything you have, you have nothing left when you're ready to get started afterwards. And so what we're here to do is provide some relief from some of those immediate financial pressures so that instead you can spend whatever time and resources and energy you have on moving forward. And so our biggest goal really is to help you feel more motivated, to help you feel well supported, and most importantly to help you feel empowered to keep moving forward towards whatever goals you may set for yourself. So we get asked this question a lot about how much the SAM Fund awards, and the short answer is that it totally depends on how much we're able to raise. We do the very best we can to award as much as we can, but we also keep in mind that we want to make a meaningful difference to your financial situation. And so instead of giving $100 to every single person who applies, we really look to see where we can make a difference and where we can help the most. And so you'll see from looking at the figures on your screen that over the last six years, We've given somewhere between $150,000 and $200,000 a year with the exception of one year. Um, and the number of grants really varies. We don't have set you know, amounts or quotas or anything like that. We do the best that we can, and our reviewers really try hard to see, um, again, where, where we can make the best impact and where we can help the most. Um, the average grant size you'll see is somewhere between $1,500 and $2,000 um, each year. And Unfortunately, there are some situations, there are many situations where someone's financial needs so far exceed that figure, and that's not to say that we won't fund somebody who has profound financial need, but what we do ask is that you keep this average grant size in mind so that you can explain in your application how that amount of money will help you move forward. And so we may not be able to help you with a $100,000 medical bill, but if a couple months, you know, of relief from paying your rent or buying groceries or, you know, any number of other things for a couple of months will give you some breathing room, then that's really where we ask you to focus. 
So who is eligible to apply? So the first two things are fairly straightforward. The third one always requires some explanation. So if you have questions on any of this, you can feel free to email us again at grants at the samfund.org. But in order to apply, applicants have to be residents of the United States. You have to be between 21 and 39 years old at the time when you submit the application. This time around, the due date is February 12th. So if you are going to turn 40 on February 11th, then make sure you submit your application the day before that. Because as long as you meet our treatment criteria, or uh, excuse me, eligibility criteria at the time when you click Submit, then we're good. Unfortunately, there are always are people who are either too young or too old when the application goes up, and unfortunately, we can't make exceptions to this age requirement. But if you have questions, again, just let us know and we'll, we'll help you answer them. As far as treatment status, when we started the SAM Fund Grants program back in 2005, there was a pretty clear cut line between being on treatment and being off treatment. And because the SAM Fund was designed to help in that post-treatment sort of phase, um, it was easier to kind of delineate what, what that meant. Now, because medicine has advanced and there are so many um, different types of treatments and different um, you know, situations, we try and be as all-encompassing as we can while still staying true to our mission. And so what that means is that applicants have to meet one of the following criteria. Either you have to have completed your planned treatment with no evidence of disease, or you have to be at least a year post the completion of your planned therapy with stable disease, or you have to be in remission and either getting long-term hormonal therapy, things like tamoxifen for breast cancer survivors, or in remission and getting long-term targeted therapy, something like Gleevec or Herceptin. Um, because we're not medical professionals ourselves here at the SAM Fund, we do have medical advisors that we consult with because we know that there are constantly new medications coming out and new treatments being developed. And so if you have questions about whether your particular treatment status um, or disease status would qualify, then just shoot us an email. We'll run it by our medical advisors and we'll get back to you quickly. So the only last thing to note is that if you are a previous SAM Fund grant recipient and you received an award in the fall of 2018, so this most recent grant cycle, we just ask that you sit this one out and wait until the summer of 2019 to reapply. And I'll just add, too, that um, grant recipients can be funded up to three times, um, but no more than three times. So I'll just add that in there as well. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Okay, so what types of grants do we award? Um, again, the short answer is that we'll consider pretty much anything, um, living expenses, medical expenses, um, insurance premiums. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff, and sometimes it's easier to answer that question by telling you what we do not provide assistance for because thankfully it's a much shorter list. But what we don't provide assistance for are things like business-related requests, undergraduate tuition requests. This one actually probably requires a little bit of explanation. Um, a few reasons for this. So first of all, if you are an undergrad and you otherwise meet our eligibility requirements, um, age-wise, treatment-wise, et cetera, you're certainly eligible to apply. Just apply for something other than your tuition. Um, so school books or living expenses, medical expenses, things like that. But the reason we don't provide assistance for undergrad tuition anymore is first of all because there are a lot of organizations that do, which is the good news. And so we would just encourage you to go to our website and find our resource lists. And you'll see there's an entire resource list dedicated to undergrad tuition scholarships that are available through other organizations. So um, the other thing is that, as I was saying before, with our average grant size between $1,500 and $2,000, we know that that doesn't really scratch the surface of an undergrad tuition bill. And so instead, in order to make an impact and to help you in a meaningful way, we would prefer to apply those funds for things like school books or, you know, like I said, anything else that you are needing to pay. Um, but tuition, there are just other resources for that. So we would encourage you to go look into those and ask us for help with something else. So we also don't provide assistance for credit card repayment. We won't repay friends or family members. Um, we know that, I mean, friends and family members obviously need to be repaid too if they've been generous and able to provide you with any sort of loan. But we also know they tend to be a lot more forgiving than outside loan companies. And so that's why we, um, we won't consider assistance for friends and family members. 
um, we won't purchase a car, and we won't consider requests for weddings or vacations. If you have any questions about this, we are happy to talk more about it. Um, and if you have questions about what we do fund or any specific categories, the link is on your, on your um, screen right now, the samsung.org slash get help slash grants. And there's a whole bunch of information about the categories that you can apply for, the maximum amounts that we will award in each category, and things like that. All right, so now we're really going to get into it and give you some insight that you know, we've gained over the years and that our reviewers have passed on to them to us over the years. We have a group of anywhere from 20 to 30 reviewers in a given year, and they, we have many repeat reviewers. They look at applications really carefully, and we have a lot of discussions. Um, and so we've compiled sort of the, the themes and the, and the pieces of information that have come up most frequently over the years, and hope that it's helpful to you, because this is sort of everything other than our official eligibility requirements that you'll find on our website. So the strongest candidates for a grant, first of all, can articulate clearly how your cancer experience has impacted your current financial situation. And you can do that in short essays. So we will ask you a few questions about that. Um, for context, we used to ask in the beginning of our grants program, we used to ask how your cancer experience affected your goals and your perspective. And really based on the answers to that, everybody should have gotten a grant. Um, but what we really try to focus on um, over the years is how your cancer experience impacted your finances. Why, go, why did going through cancer and how did going through cancer as a young adult make it difficult for you to continue moving forward? And so if you can articulate that link between your cancer and your financial situation, um, then it's going to make it easier for our reviewers to understand how our grant will be able to help you. Um, secondly, good candidates for a grant have immediate financial needs that aren't being covered by either a spouse or domestic partner or a parent or another family member. Um, you know, I know from personal experience cancer absolutely is a family affair and so are the costs. Um, but again, if you're able to get assistance or support from someone in your immediate circle, um, then you know, our reviewers tend to think that the need may not be quite as high. Um, not to say that there isn't need, but we hear from so many applicants every year who don't have anyone else, else that they can ask for help. Um, and so what our reviewers are really trying to look for are people that, to the next point, can't get financial assistance from anywhere else. Um, if you are getting help from a friend or family member, it doesn't disqualify you at all. We would just ask that you ask for something that, that you're not getting help with. So um, the next bullet, good candidates for a grant are struggling financially either as a result of treatment, so as we mentioned in an earlier slide, lost wages, high medical bills, et cetera, or are struggling financially as a result of the aftermath of cancer, so not being able to get back to work right away, dealing with side effects like fatigue that may get in the way um, you know, of, of your daily life and your employment. And finally, if you're limited in your employment options, if you can't go back to the work you were doing before, you got fired from your job, um, or you had to quit, or in some other way had a major loss in wages due to cancer, um, that really stands out. Um, we know, again, looking at the young adult narrative here, that most young adults haven't had enough time in the workforce to really build up um, not only financial resources, but also leverage in the workplace. And so when you're a young adult and are struggling with some of these employment challenges, um, there can be fewer resources available to you. And so strong candidates for a grant are dealing with any or all of these things, and most importantly, can explain it to us. Because one other thing um, just to note is that the only thing our reviewers know is what you tell them. And so if you're dealing with these things, but don't include it in your application, then there's no way for our reviewers to know that you're struggling with these things. And so please just explain yourself clearly. Um, and we've certainly had people who can explain them very concisely and only, you know, don't have to write an entire, you know, lengthy series of paragraphs about it. Just give us the information, you know, that you think will be helpful. Okay, so what do you need to apply? At the time when you sit down at the computer to fill out the application, you'll need some basic personal and contact information, which probably you have right off the bat. 
Um, you'll also need some information about your cancer diagnosis and treatment. So we ask for just a quick snapshot of what your diagnosis or diagnoses were and your course of treatment. So we don't need to get into the weeds on, you know, every last drug that you received and the dates that you were hospitalized, but we do want to know if you go through chemo, radiation, surgery, um, approximate dates and things like that. We ask for uh, truthfully a lot of financial information. Um, we ask for information about your monthly expenses and your monthly income, any assets or debts that you might have. Um, there are a lot of questions, but again, we're trying to get a thorough picture because all we know is what you tell us. And so we have had many applicants over the years who fill out the entire financial section with zeros. And that's not helpful to us either because we can't get a sense of what your financial situation actually is um, if you don't answer the questions. And so. Um, right off the bat, we know that the application is lengthy, and we know that we have a lot of questions. We keep trying to streamline as much as possible to not make it burdensome on you, our applicants, but we ask for the information that we feel is important for us to gauge your situation accurately. So because a lot of the information on here is self-reported and because we don't go through hospitals or you know clinics to um, to help us with this, we do ask for two things to sort of back up the information that you've given us. So the first is a medical history verification form which needs to be signed by a clinician. It doesn't necessarily need to be your treating oncologist. It just needs to be some medical provider, a nurse, a doctor, a specialist that you're seeing who can verify your cancer history and your dates of treatment. You'll see once we, once we put out the application and, you know, we'll be posting things on social media and on our website, we always, always, always tell you to start with this medical history verification form first. It will literally take your doctor about four seconds to sign it, but what ends up happening invariably is that at the last minute you go to get your form signed and your doctor's on vacation or it gets lost in a you know pile of papers in your doctor's office. And unfortunately, if it's not completed by the time you submit your application, then we can't we can't review your application because it will be deemed incomplete. And that stinks. We hate doing that. So please, please, please take the medical history verification form um, and get that signed first or early. Um, and so then in order to sort of substantiate the financial information, we ask for either recent 1040s tax forms or a notarized affidavit if you didn't pay taxes in either 2016 or 2017. So beyond that, You'll need to have a sense of the type and the size of the grant that would be most helpful. You'll see in the application, we're going to show you a snapshot of it shortly, but you'll see in the application you can make up to three requests unless you're asking for help with family building, which we'll talk about in a second. Again, all the categories are listed on our website under the, on the grants page, but we'll ask for information about who the grant will be paid to. Please, please do not put yourself. Um, we ask for a third-party payee. So you know, your student loan company or your landlord or your doctor's office or whatever. It's important to note, though, it's totally okay if this information changes or if you need to update it after a grant is awarded. So if you're asking for help with a computer and Best Buy is having a sale, but then once we award you a grant, Amazon's having a sale, totally fine to change it. Um, what's not fine is that you request a computer and just put your own name. So keep that in mind when you sit down to answer the questions. First, you'll have to tell us what you're asking for and how much you're asking for, but then also who the grant would be paid to. Um, so keep that in mind. So finally, with regards to family building, and this really is talking more about um, things like IVF or adoption or having a gestational carrier. This is not about the storage fees for eggs or embryos or sperm. But if you're applying for a family building grant, there are a separate set of questions and criteria, and it's all included in the same link. You'll see it, but once you um, click the box that says you're asking for family building, it'll prompt some different questions. And really what we want to know in that situation is what your plan is for family building, what your timeline is, and what the costs are going to be. And so we just want to make sure that you have a you know, well thought out plan, you have an idea of how you're going to finance the balance. Um, our grants in that category tend to be a little bit higher, somewhere between two and $4,000 generally. Um, and we want to know how that's going to help, but also knowing that that's just the tip of the iceberg with a lot of family building costs, we want to know what your plan is um, for, for paying for the balance. 
Okay, so how do you get started? Next week on January 16th, the application will be live on our website. Um, again, it's on our grants page. It will be on our home page. It will be on all our social media pages. Um, so we will do our very best to make sure that everybody knows when this application is available. Um, Michelle is going to take you through some of the um, application sections themselves. But basically, when you sit down at your computer to start an application, you'll put your name in, um, you'll click Save, and you'll enter your email address for a unique link. For anyone who's listening to this webinar who may have applied in the past, please note that we have a new application system this year, and so um, it will look a little bit different. The questions will be generally the same, and the process basically is the same. But you won't be able to go back to an application you submitted in the past unless you happen to keep a copy of it, but the interface will look different. So make sure you receive the email in your inbox before you proceed because that's what's going to enable you to save and go back to your application at any time. So if you start filling it out and you run out of time or you start filling it out and you need to collect more information about a certain question, you can save it and go back to it. But just make sure you have um, the confirmation email when you, when you set up the account. So make sure you read carefully and follow all of the instructions for each step. We know that there's a lot of information on there, and we try and keep it as concise as possible, but we also try and be as transparent as possible about what you need to do in order to successfully submit this application. And so if we ask you to fill things in and you leave them blank, or we ask for an explanation and you put, you know, I, mean, I don't know, if you don't answer it at all, then there's not a whole lot we can do with that. And so please make sure that you read everything carefully. Um, we've really tried hard over the years to make it as straightforward as possible, as clear as possible. You can absolutely email us with questions. Um, but please just be thoughtful about it when you're going through the application and know that you know, we've provided all of the information, hopefully, that you need in order to successfully submit an application. So again, please be sure to answer every question to the best of your ability and as completely and thoroughly as possible. And then finally, when you click Send to submit your application, once the forms are uploaded and the questions are answered, make sure you get an email confirmation. Um, because a lot of times we'll hear from people who think they submitted, but didn't get the email confirmation. And that's really the key. That's how we know that you submitted the application, that it went through, it was processed by the system, and sent to us. If you don't get that email confirmation, please get in touch with us immediately. Okay. Um, I'm going to take over from here. So I just wanted to give everybody a couple little screenshots of what it's going to look like, um, what the new interface looks like. And we're talking about this beginning piece here um, with the instructions, your first name, your last name, and your email. Um, it's a long page, so I couldn't include them in the same screenshot here. This is the other one. Um, the, these questions here, first name, last name, email, then you're just going to skip down to the bottom, click that nice Save button there with the uh, red arrow pointing towards it. Um, You'll see again at the top of this page, it says, please click Save before completing any questions to make sure you receive your unique link. Um, the sender will be no reply at formstack.com. Um, it looks like this is what that email looks like that you're looking for in your inbox. So you're going to want to save that because that highlighted link there will take you back to your application if you need it. Um, and then you'll be asked these set of eligibility questions. Um, if you're not eligible, it's going to skip you right to the very end. Um, there we go. This is the very last page. If you got uh, sent here and you go to click Send at that point, it's going to give you an error message that tells you you're not eligible. And please email us with any questions. But otherwise, it should just uh, <clears throat> it'll take you right to the second page. Um, so I'm not going to go through every single page of the application. I did want you all to see that email. And then I'm just going to talk briefly about the medical history verification form, which is really important. So you're going to see that you're able to download that form within the application. You'll send it to your doctor. Um, I don't actually have that here. But the, um, the doctor will need to fill out every field on that form. Um, make sure that you are indeed eligible and sign it. And that form, you can either upload it yourself or you can fax it to us um, to upload to your application directly. Um, and the form is required before your application is submitted. Please do not upload a blank medical history form and then make a note somewhere saying, oh, my doctor is going to send it in. That completed form needs to be attached to your application before um, you submit it. So just to be clear on that. 
And then in terms of the tax returns and the affidavit, you're asked to submit the first two pages of your Form 1040s from 2016 and 2017. We do realize that sometimes people fill out a 1040EZ, which is one page, and that's fine. Um, you can upload these pages as one file or separately as two files. This is something that has been a challenge for people over the last many years where we've only had one spot where you can upload one file. Um, combining those two pages has been very challenging for some people. You certainly can send them to us for help um, combining if you need, but you can actually upload them separately as two files now, as you can see on the second page. So in here I uploaded um, one page for my 1040 for 2017, and one is under, under that add file, I would click that again to add my second page. So you can add up to two pages there. Um, if you didn't file taxes in both years, you'll be asked to download and submit an affidavit, which is a form stating why you did not file taxes in one or both of those years. Um, that form must be notarized um, by a person who's known as a notary public. Um, where do you find a notary public? You can go to your public library, you can go to your local bank, um, your local city hall or court office, and even places like insurance agencies, real estate agencies, or car dealerships. There are some notaries that charge a fee, but many of them do not. So um, we definitely don't want this to be a costly enterprise for anybody, so we encourage you to start with places like the library and the bank to find somebody who um, would not charge you for their fees just to stamp your form. But another, just another word about the affidavit, um, it's a form that has several lines on it already which may apply to your situation, but they may not. Um, we don't have to be fancy about how you edit that form. You can do it with a pen um, if you want to hop online and do it you know, on, you know, in a word processing program. You can do that. It doesn't really matter. We just need some sort of information um, as to why you didn't file taxes those years. And if not, if you did bring in any sort of money, you know, what approximately did that look like? So again, edit that however it's going to be sort of most relevant to your personal situation. If you submit an affidavit that's totally blank, even if you signed it and you had a notary stamp it, um, it really is not going to tell us anything and that's really not considered to be, that's really considered to be an incomplete form. So let's make sure you include something in there. So again, this is just a little screenshot of what it looks like, so it's showing how you can upload more than one page. And at the very last page here, it says, again, this is the last page of the application, please scroll back through and make sure all your answers are correct and complete. So it gives you a chance to go back, review everything, make sure you answered everything um, correctly, completely, and then you'll click on that send, um, that send button there. And you should at that point receive um, a confirmation email from the SAMHSA, and that one will come from us, um, indicating that we received your application. If you do not receive that email, you're going to want to contact us at grants at the .org immediately so we can figure out what happened. Um, it's possible that there was some sort of error in there that just needs to be fixed on our end, um, or we can confirm with you if there's an error that needs to be fixed, then we can go ahead and do that so that we make sure your application submission goes through. Um, if you're having trouble uploading the forms yourself, you can send them to us. Um, we can either um, upload them or we can you know, email them to you once they're in the, the file that you file format you need. If you just fax them to us, that's fine, and then we can e email them back to you. Um, our email address and our fax number are listed right there. We do ask you to send in any forms later than February 8th to totally guarantee that we're able to get them back to you or upload them in time. Um, if we, you send them to us after that time, we may still be able to get them to you or upload them in enough time. We just can't absolutely guarantee it because those last couple days before the deadline are crazy. Um, everybody's sending in their forms. So again, we just want to put a, a date on this to guarantee they'll, they can be uploaded or sent to you in time. Um, again, please be sure that you look at everything, that it's all correct and uploaded before you submit. Um, we are a small shop here. Unfortunately, we can't check um, everything for errors after the time that you submit. Um, we're not able to go back to everybody for things like that, but we are more happy to answer questions or look at things before you submit. So when in doubt, if you have any questions, please contact us before and we can help you um, work out any issues. Um, and applications that are incomplete or they have incorrect forms um, won't be reviewed. They'll be disqualified. So again, please ask questions in advance and we're more than happy to make sure that you fill out a complete and strong application. Um, so again, the application will be available beginning next Wednesday, January 16th. The deadline is Tuesday, February 12th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time, and there are no exceptions to that deadline. Again, please note that that is Eastern Time, not Central Time, not Mountain Time, not Pacific Time. It's Eastern Time. So if you are not in the Eastern Time Zone, please make a note of it on your calendars. 
And we do always suggest that you get that medical history form to your doctor as early as possible because sometimes for people that is the holdup. So if you get that to them right away, then um, you have a better chance of receiving it um, back here sooner. Um, and all applicants will be notified about um, their funding status by mid to late April. Um, so we'll let you know at that time whether or not you've been selected for funding. So again, the web link to our grants page on our website where the application itself will be, where we have information up there right now. Um, and you can always email us at grants at thesamefund.org with any questions. Email is generally a much faster way to get back to us than the, um, to get uh, a response from us than the phone. So we do encourage people to email us. And I think that's it. So if we have um, any questions, we can certainly address those. Has anything come in? We can also, you know, th th we also, you know, keep a list of frequently asked questions that we anticipate people might have, even if um, nobody's asking them on the, the line live today. Does anyone have? You're, uh, um, Sam, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I'll jump in with one because I saw that it was asked and also is one that we get asked regularly, and that's for previous um, grant applicants, if you can repurpose forms that from last year's application or from a previous one. Um, as far as the information itself, you know, if you've written essays in the past and the information is still um, relevant, you can certainly repurpose that. But as far as the medical history form, we do ask that you submit a new one um, because people's health history can change and um, you know, we want to make sure that the information we have is current. And so we know that that's a pain <laughs> and we're really sorry, um, but we're required to do that. And so if you can download the new forms, get the new forms signed and uploaded, then, um, then you'll be in good shape. Great. Let's see if any other questions have come in. We've gotten, over the years we've gotten, like Michelle said, a lot of similar questions so we try and answer them publicly so that everyone can, can benefit from the information. And now I'm trying to remember what some of them were. Um, let's see, anyone else have questions? Okay, how many applications you get each year? Um, it does vary, but I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 200. Um, and we end up funding you know, a little less than half of that, I would say. Um, so just in terms of, you know, thinking about statistics. Um. I think that one thing that's important to talk about is why people don't get funded. Um, yeah, and it is idea. absolutely the worst part of what we do is having to tell people who spend the time applying that we're not going to be able to provide them with a grant. But I do think that it's really important that we're transparent about that. And so even if you're uncomfortable, I'm going to talk about it for a little bit. So in the end, if we got 200 applications, we wish that we could give 200 grants uh, without exception. We wish that we could help everyone who takes the time to come to us for help. And like I said in the very beginning of the presentation, we also want to make a meaningful difference. And as a pretty small organization, we just don't have the money to be able to help everybody at that level. And so. Um, our reviewers really have the hardest job of all, which is going through the applications and making some really, really difficult decisions. But some of the reasons why people in the past have not received a grant are, first of all, because sometimes the forms you know, are incomplete or things haven't been signed or people upload a blank form. And we know that sometimes it can be technical technologically very challenging. And so we just ask that you start early. And if you need help, you can certainly call us or email us. You can get help from a social worker at the hospital or um, a friend or family member who may be able to sit with you and help you through the process. Um, every year, without exception, over the last 15 years, we have gotten calls at 4.59 on the due date and someone's computer doesn't boot up or some other thing happens. Um, and unfortunately, at that point, it's really too late for us to help. So the biggest thing is that we just ask people to start early. And if you run into an issue at any point, just get in touch with us, and we will do our very best to help you. Um, so if it's not forms, then sometimes some of the information is either incomplete or confusing. And so again, keeping in mind that the only thing our reviewers know is what you tell them, we just ask that you are um, straightforward, you know, if you have some money in your bank account, it's not going to disqualify you. And so putting zeros in, 
isn't going to help um, because it's not going to give us any sense of what your financial situation actually looks like. Um, there are plenty of opportunities throughout the application to explain things that you think might raise questions. So if you have $5,000 in the bank um, and you note that, it's not going to make our reviewers say no to you. It's going to maybe make them wonder why you're asking for you know, help with a $500 bill. But in the past, we've gotten explanations from applicants that say things like, I know it looks like I have money in the bank, but that was just raised for me to help with this medical bill that I'm about to pay off, and next week I'm going to have no money in the bank. <laughs> or you know, there are all sorts of explanations, and we don't have any criteria on you know, thresholds for how much you can have in the bank before we'll disqualify you, or how much you can make in income before we'll disqualify you. We don't do that. We really want to understand you and your individual situation, and so you know, we just ask that you give us truthful information and explain it as best you can. And then once we get to sort of the final group of applicants who have completed all the forms and filled in all the information and given us explanations, if we're not able to provide grants to everybody, sometimes some of the reasons can be that you know the needs aren't as immediate as others. And this is where it really comes down to who else is in the applicant pool. And it's not entirely fair. And it's you know all dependent on who's coming to us for help in a given year. But you know we really try and help as many people as we can. And if we have to prioritize some applicants over, the, over others, then we tend to prioritize those people who are really struggling so profoundly that they're about to lose their home, they're having trouble feeding their children, they can't pick up medications, or they're skipping them all together, taking them half as often as prescribed because of the cost. And when we see needs that are that dire, then our reviewers do tend to prioritize them over people who you know, have a loan that's going to come due in a couple of months or um, have a bill that they could get on a payment plan for or you know, any number of other things. And so it's not at all to minimize anyone's need. We know that if you're coming to us for help, then you need help. We understand that and we you know, absolutely appreciate that. Um, but it just means that someone else may have been struggling you know, with something more immediate or more dire. And if we don't have the funds to help everybody, then that tends to be you know, the situation that we will prioritize. So I think, Michelle, anything else I'm leaving out about why people don't get funded? I don't think so. I think you had a pretty good explanation of many of the reasons that that may happen. Um, I can't think of anything to add to that. Okay. And I think one other thing we can spend a little bit of time talking about, we have just a couple minutes left, is about the categories. And people always ask us, well, what should I apply for? And what's my best chance of getting funded? And we don't really operate like that. <laughs> we don't have a you know list of the top few things that we are most likely to fund. We want you to ask for the things that are going to be most helpful. Um, like we said, you can apply for up to three things, and we do ask you to prioritize them um, in order of importance to you, knowing that we probably aren't going to be able to fund all three unless they happen to be tiny. Um, but you know, sometimes you'll notice that if you apply for rent and groceries and health insurance and you put rent first, our reviewers Usually we'll try and look at you know the top priority thing that you have asked for, but sometimes we'll we'll look at you know other criteria or other reasons for funding something else on your list. And so um, you know if if you're struggling with a few things, then I would ask for a few things. But if you're struggling with just one you know big bill, then just ask for that. Um, we sometimes will do things like, you know, if you're asking for rent and also car insurance premiums, for example, those are two things that are going to come out of your budget either way, right? And so for us, sending one rent check as opposed to five car insurance checks is going to save a lot of time and bandwidth on our end. So our reviewers keep that in mind and they may go that route. But, you know, as long as as long as you have applied you know, for the things that are most helpful to you. If our reviewers make a decision and you would actually prefer that we fund something else on your list, um, we can talk about that. But generally speaking, we ask you to put them in order of priority and we will do the best that we can to, to meet that. OK. 
Okay. All right. Well, if we if there were any questions that we didn't answer, please do email us at grants@samsung.org, and we're more than happy to uh, to address those with you um, either before the application opens, during the cycle, certainly. Um, again, we want to do everything we can to uh, help everybody submit as strong an application as possible. So thank you for listening, and um, we'll certainly keep an eye and an ear out for any questions. All right, thanks so much for joining us. Good luck to all of you who are applying, and we look forward to, to being in touch with you.